It is 6 o'clock, and it is the first Thursday of the month, and that means that it is time once again for the monthly edition of the Post-Prison Education Program. And we are lucky to have with us live in the studios today, Ari Cohn, founder and executive director, president. I can't remember all the titles, but uh, Ari, thanks for um, coming in and uh, talking with us again. Thanks. Glad to be here. You have had, as, as usual, a very busy week. I wondered if you'd uh, tell us what, uh, what's been happening this week. Well, you know, we, uh, Monday, I was on Cairo FM talking about Facebook, which might be something that we should mention here. And uh, because they, they did something that was hugely damaging to the nonprofit. And uh, then uh, yesterday, what is today? Today's Thursday, right? So, it is. So yesterday I was talking to, uh, you and I were talking to Mark Stern, uh, who formerly is Assistant Secretary of the Health Division of the Department of Corrections, about being on the show today or next month. And that that conversation got me to got me to uh, thinking about topics, and uh, I looked over to the left of my desk, and there were some um, color, high quality Xerox copies of this check from from Robert Crutchfield to me. Um, which, uh, and I thought that's something I'd like to talk about, uh, how that check came into being, and um, so here, here we are. So for those that can't see the check, maybe you could uh, at first describe it uh, visually. And um... Yeah, there's, uh, I put it on my Facebook page, and we've got it on the Post-Prison Education Program Facebook page. Um, but it's a cashier's check from Robert Crutchfield, uh, drawn on WSECU, for five thousand dollars, made out to the Alliance for Fiscal Responsibility and me. And it's dated uh, 12 2018. And it was written. Um, it actually, you know, we we have people with. We're, we've been we've been in operation for 15 years, and people come and stay and people come and go and some people get deeply involved with our students or, or, or with staff or both and some people are peripherally involved. We had a, a Googler once say that he was involved because Googlers sometimes, in his mind anyway, live in a bubble and, uh, and, and he wanted to step outside the bubble and see what's out in our world and um, but what people what we found is people who are peripherally involved think they know about the post prison education program and they don't they think they know about the students they think they know about prisoners they think they know about our budgets and they don't uh, it's the people who get deeply involved so one of the we have spent the last two years financially crippled because of the situation that led to this cashier's check being made out to me. Most people think the program has been, uh, has had, has not been able to fund people coming out of prison to the extent that we would like because Doris Buffett uh, became cognitively impaired and her foundation uh, ceased to fund. That's what people who are peripherally involved think. Maybe they read it on Facebook, maybe they read it in a newspaper, maybe they heard, heard it with you and I talking about it on your show on KEXP or on a listserv, quarterly newsletter. But that's really far from the truth. And so I thought one thing that might be good to do today is to talk about some truths people who are really deeply involved, not peripherally involved, uh, know. And uh, 
this is one of them. So, uh, you know, in 2009, actually going back a little bit further, our, our funding is contingent on our effectiveness and whether we like it or not, and I don't even know if the Department of Corrections likes it or not or cares, but um, their success is measured on a rate of recidivism. It, for a while it was measured on a readmission rate. Um, and so if they're going to do apples to apples comparison, researchers have to check out the recidivism rate for our students, right? And, you know, I'll, I remember when I was really a novice at this and super naive and, and Western Washington University was the first entity to come to me and want to research the effectiveness of the program. And I told them you can't do it. And I, because I was thinking, you, how do you measure happiness? And, and I'm, I'm, I was so stupid back then or naive or whatever. Um, well, what was Kennedy's, uh, what was the whole thing called when Kennedy was running for president and, and became president? It was, the, it was it, that was a period of time, right? It, it was like utopia or something like oh, that. Oh, Camelot. Camelot, right. So maybe I was like in, in thinking the way people in Camelot might think or something. And, and so I thought the success of the program would be measured on whether people come out of prison and gain happiness. And I thought you can't measure happiness, so you can't research our effectiveness. And that's what I told Western Washington University. And then it was like people were coming out of the woodwork. And every time I'd turn around, somebody would would uh, ask us to uh, be research, right? And, 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 and it's now called outcome data. That's what we call it. So... Um, and I kept putting them off, but as I became less and less naive and um, I was putting them off because I'd rather spend money on rent, housing, tuition, and books, clothing, treatment, and helping people release from prison than on fancy pants PhD researchers at the University of Washington or any damn where else, anywhere else. And, uh, um, and so I just rebelled against that so but in whatever year it was when wamu went under like you went, went to bed one night and wamu was wamu and the next morning it was chase bank and the feds had taken it and given it away and and the whole economy was upside down and, and uh, i think that i should probably my mother that in one 24-hour period lost four hundred fifty thousand dollars in the stock market i mean it, boom and so Gregoire was governor. If you had any chance of getting funding from the state, uh, you had to uh, you had to have data. And at the time, Ellen Vale was secretary of the Department of Corrections, and uh, and I think I said it last time, and I said it on Cairo earlier this week. I think he's the same, a really super savvy guy, and uh, uh, and. And I had a, a, a really good working relationship with him and respected him. And so he could tell me things I didn't want to hear, and, and I respected him, so I would, like, accept it right, which I don't, don't normally do. And, and uh, he, he literally, 7.30 in the morning, I'm raising bran and bananas, and I've got the secretary of the DOC on my phone talking to me about the importance of data. And, and he was like, if, if, if you have won any chance of, of funding from the government this upcoming session, you've got to submit the program to be studied by researchers. You, you have to have your effectiveness measured. So long story short, I called uh, David Lovell was on our board at that time, and he was a UW researcher and uh, research professor. And... I called him up, and then we all met at the Barnes & Noble at U Village, where there used to be a bookstore and a coffee shop. 
And it was kind of like, okay, if the secretary of the DOC is calling me at 7.30 in the morning and follows it up with an email saying, you got to do this, then we got to do it. And, and we did. So we hired Lovell, and he had to leave the board. So we, and then Lovell hired um, an anthropologist and, uh, who's now retired and a Ph.D. Uh, student, right, a Ph.D. candidate. And they researched the program the last two months, the last three or four months of 2009, and then reported it to the legislature January 15, 2010. And we'd had nobody recidivate. That's not pertinent to this story or this check, but um, which I'll just hold this up, by the way. Maybe the camera can get this. Mm -hmm. Does it? Yeah, hold it closer to you. Closer to me? Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, good. All right. And it's again, it's on my Facebook page, but it's uh, so years years later, it's time to do it again, and and um, so in 2015, uh, we had been talking. Doris Buffett, who was putting a lot of money into the program, Google and Googlers were putting uh, investing a lot of money in the program, and. There was a lot of conversation. It's time to update that 2009 study. And so I reached out to Catherine Beckett, who's a professor here at UW, and she agreed to do the research, and then she had a family issue, and she couldn't. Uh, and uh, her father died. His estate was in California. She couldn't do it. She could do it a year later, but we needed it done then. And so th we ended up with a board meeting. And at the time, we had like 13 people on the board. And a lot of them were friends and allies of mine. And, but one guy um, was married to, uh, he's like a Mr. Mom, uh, married to a woman who was vice president of Boeing, had been president of Boeing in Japan for three years, or, made name as Warehouser, a lot of money. And I think because he, everybody knew that what that marriage was about, he had more sway on the board than, than any of the other board members, including me. And when we're having this meeting about who, who are we going to hire to replace um, Catherine Beckett, then Peter, I won't say his last name, but for people who know this the nonprofit know who I'm talking about. Um, uh, he was demonstratively, he was actually idiotic. I mean, David Lovell is who I wanted to do it. He'd done it in 2009. When he worked at UW, his salary was paid by the Department of Corrections. He was highly respected by the Department of Corrections. If you went to Wisp's website and you searched his name, you'd find many, many major research projects. He was just a, a not quite world-renowned, but a highly respected, well-known researcher, and especially in our field. And some of the most important research done for the Department of Correction had been done by David. And I wanted David to do that again. We had a working relationship. And Peter, when I'm in a crowded room, I pantomime this, and it makes people mad. Uh, but he was like, Oh no, he's his PhD is in philosophy, right? We can't have somebody with a PhD in philosophy. We you know, we need a we need an icon, right? And and uh, and finally he's he's he sort of he got the board around to um, thinking somebody suggested Robert Crutchfield. And I know I knew Crutchfield at the time. We didn't have a close working relationship, but I, I knew him. I knew his career. I knew he was chair of sociology and, uh, and somewhat iconic, right? And, and, and people at the table who also knew him better than I did sort of jumped on that. And, and, and I'm like, he won't do it. I'm telling the board he won't do it. You know, he's, he's stepping down as chair of the department. He's moving into retirement. 
He's on a plane half the time to, to St. Louis. He's very involved. He was very involved in the formation of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And, and uh, I said, I, mean, he, I don't think he'll do it. And then it became like, well, why not try? And so I sent him an email, and he said, well, let's get together tomorrow. And I went out, came right out here, and met with him in his office. And, and I was right, because he, he said, I'll sign the contract to do the research, right? But I'm not going to do the research myself. And he had a Ph.D. candidate that he had mentored for many years. Um, and he said, if she'll do the legwork, then my name will be on, on, on the final report. And so I went back to the board and, and said, well, I was right and I was wrong, right? So he, he'll, he won't do it, but he'll put his name on it. If, and, and then this young woman agreed to do it. And she honestly, this is not, a, this is not an exaggeration, it turned out she didn't even know the state's definition of recidivism. She truly didn't. She didn't know, when it came down to what we needed, she didn't know anything. And so, to make, um, we're 17 minutes into this already, so we're, to make a, a, a long, horrible story short, uh, we, uh, we extended the Catherine Beckett contract from June 30th to July 30th because Crutchfield came on a month later than Catherine had or would have and um, the the first problem was and our board turned its back on David Lovell who had been a, an original board member a friend of Roger Goodman's a friend of mine I know his wife uh, and uh, and had done an excellent job and he's respected by DOC and, 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 and by the way David went on to be hired by Jerry Brown it was one of the top researchers on Jerry Brown's staff in Sacramento right um, so the, 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 the PhD being in philosophy didn't matter to people who really knew what the heck was going on but um, as we got into to all the technical with it I mean it's really doing this research is expensive because you're paying fancy pants PhD researchers uh, money and but it, it involves multiple state agencies so you got have to get a data sharing letter from the Department of Corrections that has to go to WISIP which is the Washington State Institute of Public Policy which is the research arm of the legislature uh, and and you're trying to get the DOC's data uploaded to WISIP and then from WISIP to, to our researchers right and then you have to get the administrative office of the courts, which is this teeny tiny little agency that almost nobody knows about, but it sits on top of every court in the state of Washington, non-federal. It, it's the executive director reports to the chief justice. It's a super powerful agency, AOC, administrative. They have to sign a contract with the researchers on how the data will be handled and how privacy laws will be protected. You see, and. and the first thing off the bat was this young woman was clueless. I mean, I, I, I could get really negative with this, and I'm not going to, uh, but uh, you're glad. <laughs> so, so I just, for those who were on the other side of the camera, you just went like this, that's right. So, um, but she, she, she couldn't get AOC to sign off, right? And we're like, we're almost like two months into the deal, into the work, and the data hasn't even been uploaded to the University of Washington yet, right? And, um, and so we had to go back to the guy who my board had turned its back on, to David Lovell, and w when, when Peter, the, 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 the guy that became this burdensome problem that in essence nearly destroyed the program with his actions, he uh, when he came back, it was like, well, we got to get David Lovell to help with this. And I'm like, you know what? You call him. You were the one that kept me from being hired. You call him because I'm not. And so Peter called David and talked us into another $10,000 that had to be added onto the $30,000 contract. 
And and then Lovell came on, and I think it took two days for him to get work out the deal with the administrative officer of the course and and clear all the way for the data. So then the day then then the data gets finally uploaded, I think on August 14th, to UW. And uh, and and uh, then they go to work on the data. And we start seeing errors right away. And these were horrible errors where, where this young woman was classifying non-students as students and, and classifying people as, as having recidivated on our watch when, when they were actually in prison when we met them and, 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 and they weren't, you know, they weren't our student yet, right? And uh, I mean, there's a the one that sh struck me when I got this initial spreadsheet from from Crutchfield's assistants. The thing that struck me was a, a name jumped out. Several did. One was a, a guy, who, uh, well, Gina McConnell Otten, who, whose file is this. You know, Gina. Her file is this thick. We spent a bucket of money on her. And, uh, and actually a movie was made that won an Emmy and she sort of became the star of it. And they had her classified as, as zero level of service, not a student. And conversely, there was a guy whose name I didn't know and they had him as, 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 as level two or three high, high level of service. And I didn't know the name, so I was pretty sure he wasn't a student, pretty sure he hadn't gone through the scholarship committee. And when I pulled his file, it was paper thin. That's because we never did anything. I mean, his file came in, and for whatever reason, it went straight to archives. We didn't write him. We didn't email. We didn't talk to him. There was no activity in the database, nothing. But they had him classified as a student. And that determination is really important because if you're a student and you recidivate, that affects our, 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 how we're looked at, our outcome data. Conversely, if you're not a student and, and, and you recidivate, I won't say we don't care, but it doesn't impact our data. So we, we, we had these names sticking out that were just wrong, wrong, wrong. And so our antenna went up in the office. And then, and we, got a, then we got a spreadsheet. It sort of became famous. Um, and we, just looking at it, Michelle Connolly and Bron and Huback and people, highly intelligent people. Michelle MSW from Columbia. Bron was a lawyer uh, with a social justice heart as big as Manhattan. And uh, you just could just look at the spreadsheet and off the bat without going back to the files. You knew it was it was mistaken. And so we had somebody move all these files into into one of the offices. And then we, the three of us sat in there, Bronan and Michelle and I, with laptops and desktops, and the database open, and QuickBooks open, and we audited those five or 600 files one by one, and nobody could classify them without consensus by the other two, right? And we found a 20% error rate, 20% error rate. And it, and it just kept getting worse and worse. And so finally, in November, and we, we, the board met. We were meeting every week at that point because this was like an expensive proposition. And we needed the results because, frankly, it was the end of the year when Google has giving week, and we wanted to, we didn't want to, we flat out needed to get that data out to, to people at Google. Uh, I knew about what the percentages were going to be, uh, and uh, but we needed it confirmed, right? So we're getting all this bad data when we need good data, and we need completion, and we're not getting completion, and we're months behind. We meet the board's meeting weekly, and finally, um, I think it was Elizabeth Hendren, who's an attorney at Northwest Justice Project, made a motion that we fire Crutchfield. And uh, or that she, the, the post-prison education program board asked the Alliance for Fiscal Responsibility, which is the research arm which had the contract with Crutchfield, to fire him. 
and then somebody else seconded it, and the motion carried. Everybody voted to fire him, except Peter Heyman was, wasn't in attendance that night. He was at home. He missed the board meeting. It was his birthday. His mom was in from Montana, and he forgot to pay the gas bill, and they were cooking birthday dinner on Coleman stoves in their kitchen, right? And, and so, but the next morning, he went wild. And he, and he tried to get the board meeting to, to reverse their decision, right? And, and so getting to this check was, was one of his arguments was that if you, if you fire him and don't continue to use him, then he'll sue. And then I'm like, so what? You know, we've got data up to here, and it's their data, and it's audited, and, it's, and, and so what? Let him sue. And Peter was right. He did sue. And the, the end of this story, which has now taken 26 minutes of our half hour, was if you're sued, you have to defend yourself. If you just lay down and die, they'll get default judgments against you. And then they can move to take your property. It's just that they can come into your office, take your computers, take your office furniture, conceivably take your files. They can take your everything. And, and so you have to defend yourself. And so, uh, so we, we, we had to defend ourselves. And I, uh, I shot the case, and people were scared of it because it, it, it was research, it was data, it was, it, it was an intensive mounds of paperwork, file cabinets of paperwork. It was complicated. And finally, somebody recommended uh, Farron Curry at Schwabe Williamson and Wyatt to me. And she agreed to take the case, right? Um, and the long and the short of it was that it took a hundred. We had a hundred and forty thousand dollars out of the nonprofit's pockets, which should have been spent on tuition and books and housing. And you've seen how we spend our money. You know, the office is important. That's where students and prisoners and former prisoners come to. There's a sense of community there. So there's our rent. There's students' rent bus passes, grocery cards, when somebody relapses, inpatient treatment at five grand a month. That's where that 140000 should have been spent, and it wasn't because of this, this contract that we had with Crutchfield. So we, we, we finally went to trial. That There were attempts at settlement and attempts, attempts at mediation and... Uh, and, and we went to trial, and, and I'm going to read you an email I got from Farron Curry on March 26, 2018. And she sent me the order from Judge Smith ordering Crutchfield and his lawyer, Thaddeus Barton, sanctioning them to, to pay this penalty of 5000 which, in, you know, it should have been 140000 or 400000 It was ridiculous that she sanctioned them at 5000 But she wrote, plaintiff's claims against Mr. Cohn individually were frivolous and advanced without reasonable cause. I'm going to read it again. So the judge ruled plaintiff's claims, and the plaintiff was Robert Crutchfield, um, uh, were frivolous and advance without reasonable cause. Anybody wants to see that court order, I'm more than glad to provide them a copy. Um, and so, so, and then she gave them a period of time to write this check, and then one day the $5,000 check arrived. And, this, and so there's maybe 50 copies of this sitting on my desk, and I saw it this morning, and I decided I wanted to tell that story because people who are peripherally involved don't know why uh, we're in such, uh, we've been financially strapped the last couple of years, and, and I think that they should know. So that's that story. So that clearly um, seriously caused you to be, I wouldn't say crippled, but held you back severely is that the worst thing that's ever happened to post-prison education program uh, what are some other things that have that you're wrestling with because 
the worst thing the worst thing that happened uh, was uh, a, a mentally a seriously mentally ill student who we helped immensely um, we kicked her out of the program because she violated our standards and at the time I think she was the first person we'd ever kicked out of the program and I'll come back to that story but the worst thing maybe that has ever happened to us hasn't happened yet but it's sort of in process it's sort of like if you're standing in on the train track and you see the train coming and you're maybe tied to the track um, and you haven't been hit by it yet but you know you're about to be hit by it right and that's what's happening with us right now so um, we one of the things if we did a 10-hour show and I brought 50 people in here we couldn't adequately address the animosity and the ignorance that the public and the voting public have about prisoners and former prisoners the people I think nationally but certainly in this state and, and from the from the from the governor on down and his advisor Sonia Hallam people don't even people don't understand who we've got locked up and so we've had for years problems with landlords because building owners don't want pros they don't want a nonprofit that brings prisoners and former prisoners into their building they think that that's dangerous or they think it will hurt their ability to lease to other people so we got to the end of our last five-year lease in the central building where we were for 14 years and we had to move and if we couldn't find a, a landlord that would take us in the, the post prison education program was out of business period and so in October uh, a realtor with Keller Williams found this place in Soto right and Soto's cool and, and this building is one block east of the Soto link light rail so I love that and um, the rates are so much lower in Soto than downtown Seattle that that was a major factor and so so we leased it and uh, and we we picked up more space we went from 1800 square feet to around 3,000 square feet for less money than we were paying the owners of the central building and we but we moved into an empty space if you go to the post prison Facebook page there's pictures click on photos and there's pictures there of what it looked like when we moved into it. it's an absolutely filthy dirty bare wood bare walls you could see through to the first floor through the flooring no electric I mean literally no electric no uh, cracked windows no ductwork no HVAC literally nothing and um, we had to uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this quick we had to So it had to be built out, right? And um, and so our lease required that they build it out, like have HVAC, for example, heating and air conditioning, simple things, right? And and uh, but it was also build out the the office spaces. So we were able to say we want this office to be 12 by 17, and 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 you know here's where the walls would go, and and the bathrooms and the kitchen and here's the bullpen common area and, and so on and and uh, uh, and we moved the last three days of December we moved uh, into the building and um, and it was it was winter time and it was cold and HVAC had not been even the HVAC units had not even been placed on the rooftop yet and in fact it was the 15th of March almost the end of winter maybe three or four days before spring right when the units got put on the rooftop of the 624 Southlander 
building. It's right at Sixth and Lander. And, um, and then there was some kind of permitting issue. And, um, and it took about two weeks to get permits to run the electric to the HVAC units. And so finally, um, the first week of April, the HVAC units were actually heating, right? But by then it was time to air condition. And when they came on, it was out of control. The, the work had been done by people that didn't know what they were doing. And you know, the first hint that I knew that something was wrong, we had a, a, an amazing contractor. If er anybody ever needs cabling, like Cat 3 cable upgraded to Cat 5 for cable drops for Wi-Fi and uh, VoIP telephone systems and, 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 all, of, and all of that, I, I can recommend a guy who's amazing. And, and so he, the first time he walked into the space, right out of his mouth, I mean, first thing, he asked me, what about permitting? And so, and later I asked him, why did you ask me that? And he said, because I'm, I was looking at Romex cable, and, I, and Romex, I have never seen Romex be approved for commercial installations anywhere in the city of Seattle ever, not ever, not once. And so that was the first clue that maybe these guys, that the building manager, a guy named Adam Simon and his company's real assets, something or another, uh, was, was, getting, was doing this build-out work without getting permitted. And then, then we, so we get into April, and it was comical. It, 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 was, it wasn't comical. We had a meeting with the foundation on March 29th. The office was so cold, and we couldn't control it, that we had to adjourn the meeting to Starbucks headquarters, for real. And, um, and, and then if you get the bullpen area at 72, then the student services office would be so hot we had to bring in a portable air conditioner to cool it. And the adjacent office, the executive director's office, would be so cold that we had to have a space heater in there. So the HVAC was out of control. And um, so then and for, we, we, we counted on these people for nine months to do this work and to get it right. And they, after nine months, we, we, we just we, we were done. And so we, we got involved with lawyers, and again, and and um, and you know every time we do that, it, you, it's it's not an exaggeration to say that will cost somebody's life. Somebody will recidivate, go back to prison, overdose, commit suicide. Somebody's life will go down the tubes every time we spend money on lawyers, because it should be it could be better spent doing other things. So. Anyway, we, the lawyers suggested that we, didn't suggest, just flat told me, we need to get a, a competent HVAC company in to evaluate what was wrong. So I reached out to CBRE, who I knew from the central building, and, and, a, and a manager at Cushman Wakefield, and I asked, these, these were two of the largest property management entities in, 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 the, in King County, and they're respected and they're reputable and, and nationally known. And I asked them to recommend bona fide, licensed, reputable HVAC companies, and they did. And one of them was a company, uh, uh, I didn't know it's used putting their name in there, but we asked one, of the one, like one company to come over. And they did, and they actually spent two visits in the office evaluating what all was wrong. The last visit, the tech brought the president of the company with him. And this guy's standing in the office, and he, and he asked me about permitting. And he just flat said, you know, I, we're going to give you a quote, which ended up being $13,000 to fix the mess that exists in the office right now. But we can't do the work unless it's permitted. And he says, my opinion is if I call in City of Seattle construction and inspection people to, to permit this, they will quote unquote, red flag the building, and the building will be closed. Probably all tenants will be out, and it'll stay closed until the owners um, fix, uh, bring the envelope, envelope of the building, and I don't even know what that is, up to code. So interior, exterior, wiring, all of that up to code. So at that point, we had to have the HVAC fixed. So I called, um, 
I called the uh, City of Seattle Department of Construction Inspection, which I didn't even know existed before because my degree is in political science, and, and talked to a lady and described what was going on, and they, they uh, sent an inspector out, and he's confirmed what the HVAC contractor told me, um, and it's, it's talk, when you talk about the guy standing on the track in front of the train and the train's coming, I, I think the train is, I think this building is going to be red flagged. And until the owners bring it up to code, I think we and other tenants are going to be locked out of the building. And uh, so that's going to prove to be uh, the demise. I mean, that could be, if they red flag the building next week, and we're locked out, the post prison education program will cease to exist. If it's two weeks from now, the post prison education program will cease to exist. We've got 23 trunk lines, servers, firewalls, switches, desks, furniture, files, and, there's, and if we can't access those things, uh, we're out of business. If we're not in the office answering the calls coming up in the prisons, we're out of business. And that looks to me like it's coming. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's like the, the building owners will fix it or they won't fix it. The, uh, that's, uh, and, and you know, maybe, maybe now's a good time to talk about who will get hurt by that. So I'm, I'm 72 and I'm tired, right, really. 15 years is too much. And I'm tired of fighting for funding and I'm tired of fighting with government agencies and, uh, and I'm tired of, I, I love seeing people graduate and succeed, but I'm tired of the, you know, when you, the suicides and the overdoses and, uh, and, and, and uh, so it won't hurt me it'll hurt people who are applying. We get 10, 12 applications in the mail a day. The phones don't stop ringing in the office. And it's prisoners and former prisoners desperate to get their lives together. Real, I mean, really desperate. And you've been in the prisons with us before, so you know it's, it's <coughs> and you've met so many people. Um, and, and they are desperate. And a lot of them, you know, look, if you're in prison, and, you're, and you, you make friends. You make friends for life. And you make friends at a higher level than friendship on the street is. You, it's, it's a, because it's, a, it's just a different situation. Friendship is defined in a different way among prisoners. It's like, uh, uh, I don't know if this is carrying it too far, but when, when I was locked up, I had two really close friends at this disciplinary prison I was in up in northern New York, FCI Raybrook. And... If, I, if I'm a friend for them, I'll die for them, right? And they'll, and the other way around. You know, you, you'll, you'll, you'll do whatever, you'll, you, you do things for your friends in prison that, you, that, that aren't even an issue, aren't even on the radar on the streets. And so um, we, uh, uh, I don't even know how I got on that topic. I'm, I got a little emotional, I apologize, but we're, we, uh, we, we've, we, we've, this, I'll have to go back and watch this and see what, what, how I got on that friendship tangent. But anyhow, it's, it's, so for people, I'll retire, right? And um, the program, oh, I was talking about people applying, right? Mm -hmm. And what, what they tell us is, is that, I mean, their whole, they, this is what the deal is. Now I remember. I'm, see, I'm senile on top of 72. But So, like, you're, you're in prison and you have a dinner in the housing unit because your friend's releasing in the morning, right? Six weeks later, you see him back on the yard, right? In, in DOC, it doesn't happen that way, but in the feds, it does. And, and, and so in DOC, they're, they're in the jail and then they're over at male intake or female intake. But at some point, you know they're back. So people that are locked up in the Department of Corrections, they know that people are coming out and dying. They know that they're overdosing and dying, that, that they're dying from suicide, that they're recidivating because they're seeing it. 
and it's because because of their close friends and they're st- and they're they're tracking what's going on, and so their their hopes and dreams are wrapped up in these applications. I've had people talk to me about how much time they spend it sitting in their cell writing the personal statement that, that comes in with the application. All that's go- that's lost, you know. I suppose what would happen is I would send Steve. Sinclair, the secretary of the DOC, a text saying, I need to talk to you, and then I would tell him that that the program's closing and why, and follow it up with a form letter, I mean a formal letter, and call Comcast Business, tell them to turn the phones off. I guess that's how it's done. I mean, I've never envisioned that, but that's where we're at right now because this building manager a property manager, apparently, I'm told, um, has done all this build out inside the building, all this construction, all this wiring, building rooms, putting up walls, HVAC, without getting permits, in violation of more laws than you can shake a stick at. So that's that's something that's come up really fast. It hasn't been a two-year battle like the mess with Crutchfield was. It, it uh, but it's come up really fast, and and it's something we have we have no control. I can't call funders and say, you know, we just had to pay a lawyer or a bucket of money, fifty thousand retainer, twenty five thousand retainer, whatever. Um, so help with a fundraiser. It's not a money issue. This is a you're locked out of the office issue, and and you're locked out to the buildings brought up to code, and we have no control over it. None. Do you know for sure you're going to be locked out, or they, is there potential for a window to move stuff out to another location? Well, we, there's no. That's that's why there is no other location. First of all, there's just no other location. I'll tell you a quick story. So Don was on the show a couple of weeks ago with with Joe Jensen, and our previous five year lease in the Central Building, when it was getting ready to run out, because we were there for 14 years. Dawn and I were very aware. She was managing director of the program at the time. We were very aware that the lease was running out. We had to find another location because the central building's owner at that time was not going to renew the lease. At, at a point, we had three commercial realtors looking for places and that, that would let us move in. And they couldn't find any place. There were vacant places all over. The one that sticks in my mind is sort of a historic building. It's down on the waterfront now that the viaduct's gone. It's the Prudential building. The guy's building was empty. I mean, Dan got near 100% empty because of all the pounding and the cranes and all the noise from the construction with the tunnel and everything. And, and, And he was trying to fill the building up, get tenants in to the point that he was offering $11 a foot when downtown Seattle was $28, $30, $35. He was offering $11, but he wouldn't take us. We offered him a five-year lease. We said, we'll pay for all the the build-out. You know, and... And he's and the realtor showed him media. You know, if you Google Ari Cohn post prison, we've got so much positive media. I mean, Emmy movies and documentaries and newsprint. It's almost KEXP interviews. I mean, it's 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 unbelievable. And so we, but but nothing would sway this guy. His hate of prisoners and former prisoners, which I'm sure just came out of ignorance. Um, was so great that he wasn't going to have us in the building. And two owners ago in the central building, the reason we had to move this last time was was, was the, the building was 50% vacant, and this company down in Southern California, huge REIT, multi-billion dollar REIT, KBS, the, the, the senior VP in charge of the property believed that, that when they were bringing tenants into the building, to, um, to, to to have them be new tenants, prospective tenants, that them seeing the sign post prison education program that you know would would cause them to not lease. He firmly believed that us being in the building would cause hampered his ability to to fill a fifty percent. And so it's just it's really um, it's unbelievable. And, and, and so that we we couldn't move it. it I'm sure if we spent six months, but we, we almost spent 50000 moving. 
I mean, it, it was the cabling, the Cat5 cabling, the, 50, the 56 cable drops, the switches, moving the servers. That was, that, that was $7,400, just the cabling and the switches, right? Um, the IT, the moving of the servers and all that, $15,000. Uh, the three moving trucks and eight movers over three days, I don't even know what that was. It, but it was almost $50,000. Moving the phone system. It, we, we, we can't afford to do that again if there was a place to move to. We just did it. We can't do it again. So, so no, we can't move. And, and uh, we'll see what happens. You know, we've got to, we'll see what happens. But that's, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, but, and, and it's just, I tried to get, I, I called Jenny at the last minute yesterday and said you want to be on the radio show and we've been trying to get her on but she's a mom and she's getting ready to start UW and she's an honor student from South Seattle and she's a supervisor of Catholic Community Services and she and so she says why do you always call me at the last minute <laughs> right <laughs> and uh, but you know when you when you look at people who with whatever Either a lot of assistance or little assistance, what with what they've done with their lives, uh, because of us. Really, that sounds conceited. I, every time I say something like that, I, it sounds conceited to me. It doesn't feel right. But you know, you've got uh, you've got people like Keith Whiteman, uh, Jenny, uh, and on and on. You know, Shelley Clear, I, da, 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 just on and on and on. Shalisha Hudson was just on the show the other day that have been in prison. They're recidivating machines. That's what Keith used to call them, you know. It's, and, and, then, and then we, the reason the anthropologists got hired in 2009 was the legislature wanted to know why does the insanity stop when the post-prison education program gets involved? I mean, why does somebody come out, recidivate, come out, recidivate, come out and do it for 15 years, six different times, and then the post-prison education program enters their life, and the bull, and the insanity stops, right? And 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 uh, and I I know why that is. And when Mark Stern's on the program on the radio show, hopefully next month, if we're still around, then um, then we'll talk about that because he and I have somewhat different ideas on treatment and what's effective and, and so on and so forth. But uh, when you, it's, it's those people, that, the applicants and the students, that will pay the price uh, of, of, of this. And, um, uh, and, that, and that's, that's sad. Because if we've proven anything, it's that nine times out of ten, according to the last research study, um, which, by the way, got concluded after we fired Crutchfield, I... I Worked with Anna Maria Kowski to find researchers, and we and our contract was with the University of Washington, not with individual researchers. And uh, and the data, it came out were 92.1. Our students were 92.13 percent successful. Our recidivism rate is 7.87 percent. The Department of Corrections just jumped again to 33 and a half. And and so. Uh, it's the people who will go back, who will who'll die, who won't have anybody. They won't have a phone number to call. They won't have an answer. You know, they won't. There'll be nothing where there used to be hope and too little assistance, but more than they ever got from the state. There'll be nothing. So that's that's the that's the that's the price. So what can people do? People who are listening or watching, what could they do? Um, they, I don't know. They know of realtors or, you know. No, places. well, I mean, I just don't, if, if you come to the office, it's, it's a really complicated, it's, it's a complicated office. The firewalls and the servers and the cable drops and the switches, it's in the phones, 23 trunk lines. The 800 line that rings in from the prisons um, just doesn't stop. It's one call after another. And 
I, I just think it's impossible. If the, if the building gets shut down and the uh, red flag and the owner owners react quickly to get it up to code and maybe we're locked out for two weeks, it, then um, then we can just well, maybe we'll ask the Department of Corrections if we can work from the CJC, or maybe we'll work, we'll talk to Anna Mari about borrowing some office space at UW for a couple weeks, and we'll talk to Comcast Business about rerouting phone calls to cell phones or something. I don't know, but but moving is just, it's not an option. It's just, it's too big, too complicated, too horrible. But so I, um, In the past, it's always been funding. You know, it's you know, you know uh, money would solve any problem we've ever encountered. In this case, this guy, I'm told, has broken the law. You know, he's done major construction in this building, mechanical construction, HVAC, electrical, and without permits. And the law requires that that work be permitted, and then after the work's done, be inspected. And that didn't happen, uh, and uh, so it's like it's out of our hands. It'll, it will, we'll see. I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's it's. I've never. I'm, I've actually never been in a situation like this before, and and I've been in some bad situations, and and. Uh, and we'll see. It's just, it's just uh, the the guy and his property management company broke all these laws with permitting, and the city's going to react. You know, and we're just sort of the bystander. Uh, with a lot, a lot of futures on hold. I don't know. We just, we just, you met McKenna and Marla a couple months ago, the Seattle Academy interns that, that we had in the office, and they just, as I think they described, they just went, we worked with me and Josh and Shalisha to call applicants, you know, and, and, and again, we took a whole bunch of applications and reduced the number without ever interviewing these people. It's just a matter of too little money to meet the need. And, uh, but the, the Applicant Student Services Office is full of applications. You know, and I challenge people to come to the office for as long as it's there and sit down and uh, read applications. And, you know, like Marla, I remember her saying it. She was like, she put yes on every one she read. I'm like, Marley, you can't do that. You have to say no to somebody. We can't fund this, right? But every applicant we have is compelling. And if you believe the UW research results, nine out of 10 people that we help would build lives that are really spectacular. And uh, I, was tell I was telling Dave Ross uh, the other day on Cairo uh, about I kept talking about this 40 felony guy who'd been to prison six or seven times, Keith Whiteman. I didn't, and, and and I told so many stories about people like that that Dave said I want to interview some students, right? And so I gave him six or seven names, and and they interviewed Keith the other day. So these are high value people, and and they'll their futures will be dramatically impacted depending on what happens. So how can people connect with you um, to support or to come and look at the... Um, the office address is 2450 6th Avenue South, Suite 200, 6th and Lander. So easy to get to. Just take Link Light Rail, get off at of Soto, walk one block east. Um, and my email is re.cohn at postprisonedu.org. The website is www.postprisonedu.org. The office number is 206-503-2300. By extension, the phone on my desk is extension 1001. Um, 
That's it. All right. Well, if nothing else, uh, we'll have a show with you again next month. Yeah, and hopefully Mark Stern will be here. All right.